Most of the time when patients start with, the, uh, with these activities, they're focused on um, not having a heart attack and dying. But after patients have been with us for a while, I can't tell you the number that have said to me, you know, Doc, I'm far less concerned about dying these days. The thing that really scares me is disability. Well, that is a very interesting thing, and that's the same perspective that I have personally and for my patients. And here's one of the reasons why. We're, I'm going to do a series on major disability and the number one cause of that disability, strokes. So we'll go into a lot of the statistics, the CDC statistics showing that every 40 seconds in the U.S. somebody has a stroke, every four minutes somebody dies with it. We're not going to get too deep right now. This is going to be an overview of that series. Here's why stroke is so important, right here at the bottom. Stroke reduces mobility in more than half of stroke survivors age 65 and older. Well, what does that mean? Here's what that means. You know, you don't see a lot of people... You get worried and concerned about things that you see on a regular basis. Uh, so a lot of people don't think about stroke or worry about it that much, and here's why. You tend to not see the people that have had strokes anymore. You don't see them at the restaurants. You don't see them as much at church. You don't see them in routine places where you would, you don't see them at the Y, because now they have a totally different life. Um, that motion, that movement disability results in wheelchair. So now you're focused on, okay, some wheelchair accessories. You're focused on a walker. You're uh, looking to get home health care. You're getting a ramp in your home for your wheelchair. Now, I'm, again, there's some great nursing homes out there, and you can be very happy in a nursing home, but it's sort of like the, uh, the hats about fishing, where a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. For sure. I, th I don't think anybody would disagree that a, ba a, a bad day without uh, the disabilities that put you in a nursing home is better than a good day there. Nursing home and uh, adult daycare is growing, and it's growing dramatically. And a startup jungle here has said, look, there's a major growth in... Um, in demand here for adult daycare and let us show you how to set up a business there. I haven't met a patient yet who wants to become that kind of, uh, create that kind of demand. Now, <clears throat> I quote CDC a lot and almost every time I do, I'm, I mention the fact that they're extremely conservative. Well, they're conservative here. Their point is that a third of U.S. adults have at least one of the leading causes of stroke. Now look to see what they mention, and let's go back and think about some of these uh, some of these numbers. Blood pressure, most common cause of stroke, not the strongest cause for an individual. Uh, the strongest cause for an individual is atrial fib. But blood pressure, they mentioned. Uh, remember some of the update information after the redefinition of blood pressure. Getting close to half of Americans have high blood pressure alone. So again, you begin to see how conservative these numbers are. And there's a lot of overlap with, lap with these numbers, high blood pressure, diabetes. I have both of those, and I do all the right things in terms of um, lifestyle. I also have obstructive sleep apnea and the most powerful risk for uh, stroke, atrial fib. So again, we'll get back to atrial fib again in some of the other, in this video and some of the others. Um, now here's the opportunity. And here's why this is uh, so frustrating. Again, we tend to think of stroke that's just, if you can't prevent it. There's something that you're, uh, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I've heard that more times than I want to relay. Even the conservative CDC will say four out of five, 80% of strokes are preventable. And how do you prevent them? Again, you may, you, um, we'll talk about that in this series. Now, <clears throat> I usually focus completely on prevention, but there are a couple of places where I focus on recognition and treatment as well. Uh, for example, the other place is heart attack in women. 
Uh, one of the major problems with women in heart attack is that they don't, often don't get the chest pain that men get. Uh, they often will just get anxiety. So that's an area where obviously we need to make people aware that women can just uh, have very unusual presentations for a heart attack. Same thing with stroke. Um, let's talk about, uh, about this for just a second in this video, and we'll go deeper a little bit later. Although 93% of people understand sudden numbness on one side is a sign of stroke, only 38% are aware of all the major symptoms and knew to call 911 when that happens. So again, there's a major campaign to help people understand the symptoms of stroke. There's going to be a, I will cover a nice video from uh, the NIH focusing on this area. The bottom line is there was a wife who noticed that her husband got confused. Uh, you've seen, you may see videos on this uh, on the internet where news, uh, news instructors or uh, news people, news ladies, news men suddenly started having uh, inability to talk. That is a major um, warning sign for stroke. Now why is it important to recognize it quickly? Here's the thing. If you get the patient in to uh, medical treatment. Uh, they can use often clot buster drugs and uh, greatly decrease the, um, the disability, the permanent disability associated with stroke. And that's exactly what this lady did. So this is a great success story and it's a helpful thing to, to think about, something that we all need to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> um, if you've heard me talk for more than 30 seconds, you know I'm from the Deep South. And yes, that's the stroke capital of the U.S. We're going to talk about statistics a little bit later. Now, we'll get into some, um, again, some basic risk factor understanding. Um, talk a little bit more about atrial fib um, and the interaction between atrial fib, high blood pressure, obstruct obstructive uh, sleep apnea and uh, again, how to deal with those. Now, this is a, there's a serial killer. Um, stroke is. And in fact, it's uh, sort of like Jack the Ripper. You know, it's killing a lot of people. It's in one of those, it's a mystery right now, but there's evidence growing that um, it's actually uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Now what does that mean? Paroxysmal is sort of like, it means, uh, it's a technical term for sporadic. Atrial fib will come on and sometimes you'll notice some um, fluttering in your chest, sometimes you won't notice anything at all. But still you have major risk for stroke associated with atrial fib. So the evidence is beginning to grow just like it would grow around any other case of a serial killer. And again, even worse, this is a serial disabler, and there's, a, uh, uh, there's some mystery we're beginning to solve. For those of you who uh, want to get back into some of the basics to understand atrial fib and why it is such a major risk factor for stroke, we'll do that. Um, we'll, in order to do that, we have to understand a little bit about the basics of how the atria of the heart lose their uh, normal uh, beat ability and become very chaotic, resulting in atrial fib. Again, there are plenty of nice um, infographics out there on the internet. We'll use a couple of those to help explain that. We'll get back to some of the basic Baildonine cardiogenetics. You know, they, they wrote the book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene. That's on the ninth chromosome, the P21 area. This is a stroke gene that we're talking about and that's on the fourth chromosome, the Q25 area. For those of you who get um, Mendelian, you know, Mendel was the father of um, genetics. I personally uh, have, am homozygous for that. Homo meaning the same, zygous meaning the zygote or the allele, the, um, the gene. So I have two copies of the risk gene. If you look at it, which means I got one from my mom, one from my dad. If you look at it, uh, there was a 30% probability that my mom would have this, if you look at the general population positivity rate. 
And so there's a one-third chance that everybody watching this has that gene. Uh, one-third times my mom, or 30% probability from my mom, 30% probability from my dad, and um, the probability, you multiply that out, uh, the probability of me having, or those of us that have homozygous is about 10%, 9% actually. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about, we're going to get deeper into the science of the genetics for those of you who are, who are interested, and we'll start from some of the original uh, studies 10, 15 years ago showing that, for, that Q25 area of the fourth uh, chromosome uh, and how those first genes were discovered. Then we'll talk a little bit um, more deeply in terms of updates on that. And at this point, we've gone from having two, uh, one area to two areas to now there are over 30 places where uh, there are SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Again, pardon the scientific words, but just areas on our genes where we can have variations which lead to this Jack the Ripper, the stroke, uh, atrial, atrial fib. Again, so much of it being totally silent and totally unrecognized. And we'll go, again, into the actual articles. We'll have a couple of videos on that. Now, that's all very interesting, but what are you to do? Well, I've, got, I've already got a series of videos on atrial fib. I shared my own uh, diagnosis. See, I would be one of those people that would have silent uh, atrial fib and not know about it if I didn't do this kind of stuff for a living and if I didn't have a high index of suspicion. And you can have a high index of suspicion and you can do, I mean, you can get this on Amazon. I, I've shared that. Uh, we'll update those videos. This is an electrode that hooks to a, um, by Bluetooth to a, uh, an app on your iPhone. It's, now there's an app for that. And I diagnosed and confirmed my, um, my atrial fib with it. Yes, I went to a, a cardiologist and the cardiologist did recommend a, an ablation. Ablation is where they go in and um, supposedly cure um, atrial fib by uh, cauterizing, burning some of the areas where you get a short circuit. Again, we'll talk about that as well. But I didn't elect that because one of the reasons is because my obstructive sleep apnea. Another reason is because of my genetics. We'll cover the science behind uh, the fact that there's a, at least a 30% failure rate in uh, ablation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, why that tends to concentrate on people that have the risk gene and that have obstructive sleep apnea. But that's a digression. For those of you who are still hanging in there with me, I appreciate it. We'll cover that again in this series. But back to the electrode. At this point, this elect, uh, electrode has become so popular, there are competitors to it. Again, also available on Amazon. So we'll get a little bit more into detail on that as well. As you can see, we're covering a lot of content, and I've covered a lot of content in this video. It's been long. Thank you very much for your attention.